you have to live life executing on the things that are in your imagination. The worst thing that I think can happen to anybody is to be on their deathbed at some point in time and say, I wish I did. I guarantee you, if you start acting on the things that you wish you did, you would achieve those things in this lifetime and live the life of your dreams. So don't put a cap on anything that you're doing. If you could envision it, if you could think it, you could do it. And if you do it, you'll be so satis- you'll be so satisfied with what you've done. Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the Max Maxwell Show. I'm your host, Max Maxwell. I am a real estate investor and serial entrepreneur for you who do not know. And this is my show. And today and every day, I bring a guest to the show that truly just interests me. And if it interests me, I interview them and hopefully you learn something from them and their life story. And today I have somebody that is hailing from Actually, I don't know where they're hailing from because they're all over the place, and we'll get to that a little bit later, but welcome to the pod. Welcome to the show, Carl, man. What's up, brother? What's up, man? Thanks for having me. Absolutely, man. Listen, I don't know exactly how we connected in the beginning, right? Because were you in Charlotte at one point or something like that? No, never in Charlotte. Like, not not physically, but I just... Because I've been trying to follow what you've been doing, and I'm trying to recall... It's like I maybe seen some real estate content from you, but then I don't know you as the real estate guy because you're just all over the place. And then as of recent, I got real interested when you started doing a lot of traveling and talking about living abroad and enjoying life that way. But before we kind of dive into that, kind of kind of give like a little pitch of who you are and what you do now. So essentially, I'm from Jamaica, Queens, a, a town okay. called Queens Village. Yeah. And uh, I ended up getting into the healthcare business through my mom. She's a nurse. Okay. And she decided one day that she wanted to start a nursing agency. So me being the only computer geek in the house that knew how to function on a computer, <laughs> I ended up becoming her assistant. And uh, we've grown that business out to doing about 12 to $13 million annually. Mm-hmm. Um, but there is a story in our life because we moved from Harlem, New York to Queens Village because Harlem in the 80s was pretty uh, yeah. rough. Right Not now. So when my mom was looking for a house, she wanted us to have a yard to play in. That was important for her. So yeah. she ended up buying a house on a double lot. And in the early 2000s, somebody comes along, knocks on her door one day, offers her $120,000 for the lot. She bought the house for $90,000. So she was like, you could have the yard. My kids are growing up. Do what you want with it. I was always told that we couldn't develop this lot anyway. It had its own address. It was a proper lot. Oh, wow. Within six months. He built a two-family home, bumped it off for 600000 And for me, that left a sour taste in my mouth. Like, wow, we just missed out on an opportunity just because we didn't know how. Now, this is before the internet was available where you could actually learn things on the internet. Yeah. Right? You could only go into the chat rooms, meet people, that sort of stuff. But that always made me think that there's much more money in real estate than anything else. So from that point on, I always had in my mind that whatever money I make, I'll invest in real estate. So my world is healthcare and real estate predominantly. That's where I've generated my income, my wealth, et cetera. Mm-hmm. So um, for me, what ended up happening is I started to get asked by a lot of people. Well, how do you make your money and what do you do? And investing in real estate, it's something that people are familiar with. Yeah, everybody so knows. Everybody knows. I got tired of answering the same damn question. <laughs> so I started a YouTube channel so that I can talk about this thing and point people in that direction. Hey, if you want to learn how to flip a house, then just go to my YouTube channel because I'm tired of talking about it. I used to go to meetups, mm-hmm. meet a lot of people. Same thing. I got tired of saying the same sort of rhetoric. But maybe, I'd say about two years ago, I was on the Earn Your Leisure podcast mm-hmm. talking about Healthcare staff. What episode number were you? Don't know. It's like in the 60s or 70s. Okay. So I was like number 50, I think. Episode 50 or somewhere around there. So uh, I ended up getting on that and I started to get emails. Hey, how do I start this company? How do I start this company? How do I start this company? And I was like, you know what? I'm getting enough inquiries. Let me start talking about it on my channel and see if people are really interested in this. Mm -hmm. Again, how do you start a home care agency? Kept getting those emails. So you know what? I'm tired of answering the same question. Put together an online course. And that online course has done pretty well so far. I would say it averages anywhere between eleven and fifteen thousand a month. Mm-hmm. 
um, best kind of month passively at this pass, point. Yeah. Totally passively. I don't run ads or anything like that for it. Uh, best month was maybe 22,000 mm -hmm. and enough people were showing interest in that, that I decided to actually form a full scale consulting, a full scale consulting company that focuses on getting people from start to launch. And that's a higher ticket item that we also sell. And it mm -hmm. brings me a lot of satisfaction to be able to teach people how my family has made money and what has ultimately led me to investing in real estate and putting people on their own track to move away from the bedside in healthcare, which is quite dangerous at this point, to being in the owner seat and being able to run their own business. So that's pretty much my story. What what gave your mom that spark? Uh, she saw she saw an invoice at her nursing facility. She was a oh. uh, assistant nursing director at a nursing home. And she saw that they were using agencies. She saw how much they were paying. And she was like, well, I could probably get into this. Wow, that's interesting. And then you just naturally became her assistant because you got the computer skills. You're like me, you're the, the computer nerd in the family. And and then it just sparked. That that's an interesting kick, you know. Um man, that's that's a that's a cool story. I I, I like that. And so now for most people that don't know much about like that side of the healthcare world, you're you're an, is you're essentially an agency for nurses and so providers and what do you call the other side, I guess? Uh, clients. Clients, patients. yeah. Patients. Yeah. So we're in two lines of business. Okay. And that really confuses people. So I'll, I'll try to break it down into the two pieces. Sure. So on the nursing agency side or medical staffing, we are hiring healthcare professionals and subcontracting them out to other facilities. This could be hospitals, nursing homes, schools, assisted living facilities, even other home care agencies. But we also got into the home care business, which is different because you're hiring the caregivers and sending them to provide patient care one on one to the member or the client in their home. Got so it. we're in the same space because it's both of them are staffing agencies. You're hiring yeah. personnel, placing them to work somewhere and obviously making a spread between just a different client. Just a different client. It's just where the where is the worker going? Mm -hmm. Are they going and servicing a patient one on one? Or are they going and working inside of a facility that is servicing patients? Makes sense. I like that. Um, so at this point, you've been in, how? I mean, how long have since your mom started that you, the family's been in now? Wow. Talking about from 1996 till now. So Wow. A long time. Yeah. Okay. And so how is, has, you know, with anybody being in business that long, especially something like that, that's just heavily kind of, I don't know, regulated. Has you, Have you went through the ups and downs of maybe seeing like regulations or changes in the industry that kind of made you had to adjust or pivot at any point in time? It's constants every year. Okay. Right? That Medicare and Medicaid and the state always comes up with something new. And right? that has to do with like billing or what you can and can't do and everything. Billing, what you can and can't do, changes in what's included in a personnel record, uh, how do the payers change? How many contractors can the payers have? It's it's always something new. What do you do to keep up with that though? You just have to adapt. You just have to change. There's nothing else that you could do. I, I try to run as lean as possible. Um, a lot of our business, we have developed uh, offices outside of the country. So we work with international workers, especially for a lot of the administrative work. Mm -hmm. So that keeps our expenses lower than our competitors. A lot of people are just hiring you know, within State the side, States. Yeah. Not necessarily getting better quality, but uh, that's what they're doing. So you, you've you been using kind of like the virtual side, virtual before it was a thing in the real estate world? or uh, I probably started with virtual back uh, maybe five or six years ago. Okay. So and I, don't, I don't even like calling them virtual workers. I don't either. Yeah, I, call I, like call them them, I call them remote workers. Yeah, I call them my, my colleagues and yeah, my yeah. employees. Because virtual to me insinuates that they're not real people. In yeah, a way. So I, like, I have that sentiment for a long yeah. time. I just have remote employees. Um, from outside of the you know company's home base, okay. And so let's let's jump into real estate though, because you you mentioned that your mom had bought a double lot, then then she sold it to somebody, and you, and you realize what went up next door and how much it sold for. Mm -hmm. You started flipping properties yourself. Yeah. So the first real estate deal I ever participated in was in 2006. So that was you know the wild wild west of real yeah, estate. Yeah, I was days. say. So I was graduating from Stony Brook University, and I was going into the radiological sciences. Right. So there was a, a clinical year that had to be done after graduating. Mm -hmm. But since I graduated from the university, I was no longer guaranteed housing. And me and my fraternity brothers and the guys that I was hanging out with that were going into that program were in the same situation. 
one of us happened to be a mortgage officer. And he was like, man, I could get you guys a loan. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> it was a, it was a no doc stated income, 104% financing. And <laughs> so. I had some money at the time. So I was just the, uh, the binder down payment. Mm. Right. And what we did with this house is that we subdivided it into rooms and turned it into like a little kind of dormitory frat house. Yeah. And we're able to make money from that. And uh, since it worked, we got another property and then the market crashed. So in 2009, I did my first deal independently. It was a in the same neighborhood because it was working. for. This is all like in the New York area? All in the New York area. Okay, okay. Right? So in 2009... What's cool about 2009 is that Obama just came into office. The market had just crashed, and they were doing a first-time home buyers. I remember that credit eight grand just for buying a house if you're a first-time buyer. I remember that. At the same time, me and my mom went to this conference that was pretty scammy. It was the National Grant Conference. They were promising uh, to sell you the information. They consolidated all the grants and federal loans mm. in the country. And they're like, you could get this free money if you just buy into our program. It's free, just pay me. Yeah, 2000 bucks. I'm coming through that saying, I got to make my money back. That's like something that I pride myself on. Mm -hmm. If I spend money to learn something, I got to make my money back. You got to put something. it to work. Right? So, boom, FHA 203K loan. So this seems interesting. 3.5% down, plus they'll pay for the rehab costs. So I was like, you know what? Let me find a house that this could fit. When I started shopping around for the 203K, this remember, this is in 09. Mm-hmm. So everything before then was these, you know, hokey doke loans. You could do whatever you wanted. Yeah. So people got away from FHA because you could do 100% financing. Why would you need that? Couldn't find a bank that would do it, right? So I finally found a bank that would write the loan. They didn't have experience with it. Uh, ended up doing it. And that was the first project that I bought and fully renovated. I bought the house for 300000 Market value was like four ten. And we ended up doing about nine ninety thousand dollars in uh, renovations. It, the math, unlike flipping property, the math was that after renovations you had to be at least at market value or less. Mm -hmm. You couldn't be above market value. It wouldn't make sense. So that was my first time fully rehabbing a home. The other two homes were kind of retail properties. Mm -hmm. Buy them, chop, put up a wall here and there, so we get some more bedrooms, and rent it out. So this was the first one that got me actually into flipping. Right, actually restoring homes and and adding yeah. value that way. But I, I, it was an old person's house, so it was just outdated. Yeah. Okay. And then from 2009 to 2012, I didn't do any other deals because I only had my one bullet. Right. That, so that 203 loan. Yeah, I only use it. <laughs> right. So I was like, okay, what do I do now? And then again, I went to another conference, and this conference was actually I was trading stocks um, at the time, day trading, and the head of the firm started to invest in private companies. So he got invited to this conference where there was a bunch of companies raising capital. One of the companies was asset-based lending in Hoboken, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. At the time, they were just getting into hard money lending. They, they had $4 million of lending capacity, right? And it was their money because they, they were working in mortgage-backed securities, lost their jobs, mm -hmm. had a had a couple of dollars, got on the other side of the deal and started doing hard money loans. And then read through their program. It's like, hmm, maybe I could, maybe I could do this again. Started flipping real estate with hard money at that point. And then from there, it went from like doing one deal a year to four deals. And then in 2019, I did about 15 or 16 flips. Wow. Um, predominantly where? Predominantly in New York. Wow. So, so upstate? Most first it was Long Island because it was uh, kind of the area that I knew. Yeah. Um, and then Long Island got started getting priced out. Mm -hmm. And then I started looking into Orange County, so Middletown, Port Jervis, okay. those sort of areas. That's good. I mean, that's a good run. And then the did you, but during this entire time, you're still focused on the main thing, which is the healthcare stuff. You're oh man, my life was absolutely nuts because so <laughs> I became an X ray tech. Right. So that was my my path. Radiological you sciences. Say, you, you sound like me that you've done a little bit of everything. Um you more than I've mentioned so far. So <laughs> yes. like music production, flipping cars, salvage vehicles, uh, t shirt screen printing. I did yeah. that in college. Every, there, there's not all. yeah, I don't think there's there's not many industries I haven't been in. So I have a good working understanding of how most businesses work and how most things function. Mm -hmm. Um, which serves me well today. But 
I graduated and I was working overnights and weekends. My Monday through Fridays were clear for the business, trading stocks, and uh, I actually opened a co-working space, like a, kind of like a WeWork sort of space. So I always kind of had one foot in the W-2 world. And it's something I recommend to anybody who's like an entrepreneur. Like a lot of people will say, you know, quit the job. And I kept my job because it provided me with income, took the pressure away of having to take money out of the business. Mm -hmm. uh, when they started to mandate that kind of management gets paid, I put myself on at minimum wage just to satisfy that mandate. But I'm an advocate for actually working while you're building your business. It takes a lot of pressure off. It gives you money to keep growing that business. I'd say it all the time. I say that in this day and age, like a side hustle is 100% necessary, especially if you're trying to go somewhere, get things done. Like you, it's just consider it normal. Get you a side hustle. Cause without that, you're just drawing down. Yeah. You only got one, you got one spot, man. You got one, one source, but but yeah, go ahead. Sorry about that. Yeah, no, but that that's kind of how it worked out for me. So with time, I think doing all the other things actually allowed me to learn and bring back to my company. Mm -hmm. Because by the time that I graduated from college, we were doing maybe like 1.4 million annual rev, right? Not much. And I started when I started trading stocks, I started to see how companies like Facebook went from this application in a dorm room to public offering, mm -hmm. raising capital, organizational structure, just the things that were missing in my mom and pop business. So I started to take what I was learning from, I can't really say Wall Street because prop trading is not really that, but whatever. Um, but what I started learning from just looking at how other financial companies were being run and how money was moving, I was like, mm -hmm. no, we, we have to change how this business functions. And we were able to start growing that out. Um, but at all times, it's always been one foot working, one foot building businesses and whatever extra money I have testing different ideas. The like real that. estate just always worked. Yeah. Right? Good times, bad times, you know, property values appreciated, rents typically get paid. It, it's been my kind of safety net, so to speak. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's the easier business that I'm in. Yeah. When, when you... I mean, obviously you grew up in the healthcare industry just through your family business. What what lessons and tools did you bring from healthcare into real estate and, and vice versa? And when you were in real estate pretty heavy, what did you bring back to healthcare? Um, I can't really say there was anything that I saw that was kind of overlapping. What I did recognize is that when you're when you're in a traditional business, and you're looking to take on debt to grow your business. They're going to evaluate you based on your business. And then they're going to evaluate you based on your personal assets, especially if you go into SBA, right? Mm -hmm. They want to know that you have collateral. So when I went for my first SBA loan, I couldn't get approved because I didn't have enough equity in the real estate that I owned. Mm -hmm. So then that made me think, okay, well, if I want to be more credit worthy in the future, I need more real estate because that's going to allow me to, be more credit worthy in paper, be able to borrow more money so I can invest more in my business, even though it's just kind of sitting as collateral. So I can't really say that the two worlds are very similar. They're very different because uh, most of the revenue in home healthcare and healthcare staffing in general is government money and kind of private insurance money. Mm -hmm. um, real estate works a little bit differently. What about like just like overall the overlook things like running a company and dealing with people and personnel and managing a timeline though those things kind of have to cross at some point or yeah they can lend to it yeah. yeah they cross but not not directly i think in having to grow a company it allows me to look at any other business whether it's real estate or, or something else mm -hmm. to think what this organizational structure need to look like how can you continue to grow your business if you don't have a marketing division how do you grow your business if you don't have a business development arm so the things that were happening in the healthcare business kind of naturally from an organizational standpoint, I started to apply towards real estate in a way, mm -hmm. but I would say they're, they're pretty different. So as of late, I've been seeing you do 
some pretty interesting things and you have a youtube channel what, what, what's the, what's the youtube channel name so my youtube channel is entp life it's a, a nod to my personality type so there's 16 personality types mine just happens to be entp so okay. i decided to create a channel about how entps function in the world and this is what it looks like we're kind of scattered we get our hands in a lot of things we're problem solvers naturally so i wanted to kind of nod to that but um Maybe in 2019, my brother who lives out here in Winston. That's crazy. Yeah. He sent me an article. He was like, yo, they're selling homes for a dollar in Italy. And I was like, what? It's a CNN article. And I was like, okay. Funny story is that in Harlem, New York, they did the same thing. Harlem was so bad that they were selling homes for a dollar to nurses. Yeah. They were selling brownstones for a buck right? To nurses, firefighters, like community workers. Yeah. And my mom didn't opt in because she wanted to get the hell out of Harlem, right? And now property <laughs> values are what they are. It's yeah. a bad move, mom, but just like the yard. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> I saw that as kind of the same thing. And he was like, you know, why not just buy something out there and it would be cool to have a vineyard in Italy. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to go out there and check this out, see if it's real. If it's real, I'm going to buy something. And if, if I buy something, I'm going to film everything, right? And kind of make the content out of it. So I went out to Italy right before the pandemic started. Actually, I was in Italy when Italy recorded its first COVID death. I flew in and I was like, they already had like all of the uh, temperature screeners. Yeah. They Everybody maxed up, suited up. I was like, what the hell is going on here? These what people have lost their minds. Yeah. So uh, I went out there and... Turns out that they are selling properties for just one dollar. You could get really good properties in Italy for like sixty grand and less. And in some towns, it's usually like ruined type of properties, abandoned properties that you're selling for a dollar. More of a marketing stunt just to get attention, but it's totally real. And so it was crazy because my wife and I have been looking at a lot of like uh, content as far as dealing with living outside of the United States and owning multiple homes in different areas and we came across your stuff again and I'm looking, I'm like, I've seen that guy. Right. I'm like, and then we're watching and you're talking about, no, actually at this point you're showing you in Italy going to buy a home and you show a couple of homes and you're like, oh, I don't want this one. And you, I think you went to like three or four or five or something. And then you was like, yeah, okay, well I bought this one. And then I bought that one and then I'm going to fix them up. So, so, so kind of walk me through, you get there, what happens? How do you find out it's real? Well, I get there at night <laughs> and it's completely empty, right? So I was like, oh man, this is really a ghost town. Nobody, nobody lives here, right? It's like, I don't think I made the right move, right? And it was nighttime, so I couldn't even see the roads. Like you have to imagine driving through the countryside of mm -hmm. Italy on the highway at like 1 a.m. There's no cars on the road. There's no lights in the street. You can't see what the hell's around you. Yeah. And then you go to this town and there's nobody outside. And it's winter time, so nobody, definitely nobody's outside. Yeah, definitely nobody outside. So I was like, I think I, I think I made a bad decision coming out here. The next morning, I walk outside and there's people outside. You know, old guys smoking cigarettes, drinking coffee, and uh, they call me over. Right, obviously I stick out. So I call me over. He's like, "Come here." He's like, "Where are you from?" I was like, uh, "Right now I'm living in the Miami area." He's like, "Hold on, hold on, hold on." He goes inside to the coffee shop. <laughs> he gets his friend. He speaks English. Talk, right? So the friend comes over to me. He starts practicing his English with me. And one other guy that's old keeps just saying, one euro, one, and pointing to the village. And I was like, yeah, yeah, that's what I'm, that's what I'm here for. So my first impression was like, all right, there's some people here. And these people are actually nice, right? They saw me as clearly a stranger. And started oh, to engage in, me, yeah. want to practice their English with me. So I felt like, all right, this seems right. Take the tour. And of course, since this real estate agency was in a major publication, you get a lot of tire kickers, right? People who were like, you know, I'm going to buy a one-year home. So they organized this tour with me and a couple other people who are interested in these one-year homes. And they're showing us these homes and they are crap. Trash. And then the agent's like, you know what? Um, let's break for lunch. After lunch, I'm going to show you what we call the premium listings, right? They're in better condition, still in the historic center. You feel like that's part of the, I'm going to get you here? 
Yeah, for sure. Okay. For sure. It's definitely it's definitely the carrot on the stick. Okay, right? okay. It's like get okay. people here and you know, if they want the one euro home, fantastic. If they want something else, there is something else. Because you could see people like, Wow, I don't know if I want to do this. They've never they they wouldn't do that in the United States, much less exactly across the world. Across the pond. So we come back out and they start showing me the premium properties. The first premium property is actually the one that one of that I bought. Mm -hmm. I walk in and I was like, all right, just based on the fact that this has running plumbing, <laughs> windows, four walls. You could live here. I could live here. I could clean this and just move in for $5,000. And I was like, and that house right across the street for one buck would cost me way more than 5K to, to get, get it to, to this condition. So I was like, all right, this is one I'm going to buy. So $5,000? 5000 Like a whole house. Whole house. 5K. In a town, it has it has a fire department, has a hospital, has restaurants, bars. Ten thousand people live there. It's a functional town. Oh wow! So it's not really a ghost town, mm -hmm. as far as I'm concerned. So for five thousand dollars, you own your property outright. Now, people who are from America, they have no problem buying these homes, right? So you could own a home in Italy outright between five and twenty thousand dollars easily. So you don't have to worry about a mortgage. You don't have to worry about making rent. Cost of living is really cheap there. But these things are out there. They exist. How big is it? This so house, the first one, because I remember the five K house is about five hundred square feet total. Okay, so New York ish. Yeah, no, new large New York. Yeah, that's a large New York. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's a large New York studio. Yeah. So, uh, but it's a one bedroom house. So on the second floor, it is a bedroom, bathroom. First floor is just kind of kitchen, common kitchen. Area. So it's a place you can come visit with your family if you want to, or Airbnb it in the off season, or just conversation yeah i own a house in italy yeah so it's a it's a nice uh it's this nice stun button yeah you could you'd be like yeah i got this house in italy if you want to go spend a week there you can and then i have another house um around the corner from there that was more for my family i got mm. two kids so um that house is three levels so if you think about like a three level brownstone mm -hmm. it's like that so i saw it and i was like wow i could convert this into two family first level because it's first level is kitchen bathroom and living area and then the main door that goes to the second and third, the door, the main door goes straight to the stairs. Okay. So you could just put up, up a, that, yeah. yeah, put another door here, put another locking door at the top. And now you have that's that New York brain thing. That's New York brain. Yeah, yeah for sure. Down here. <laughs> yeah. You could stuff somebody in the basement closet, garage conversion, everything. Yeah. That's how we think. <laughs> so, so back to that first house, cause this, mm -hmm. this th really fascinates me because this isn't part of my wife's and I's plan is to, after seeing your thing, it was cause we've, when we were in Dubai, somebody had mentioned that, I think her brother had mentioned that he's seen something and then all of a sudden we get home and boom, here you go. And like, so now you, you buy this house for 5,000. I saw the video, you renovated it. Mm -hmm. How long did the renovation take? Uh, the renovation took about two years, not because it needed it's a, two years. It's a ago. six week at most okay. renovation, right? By my, my standards, but they shut down Italy right after I left. Oh, that's so right. You're doing the supply chain got interrupted. People couldn't work, couldn't go outside. So Italy had a pretty hard shutdown. Yeah. Because they, they were like, right after China, they were the big hotspot. So they didn't know what to do. They, and they have a very old population in Italy too. Yeah, it's very risky. Yeah, so they shut down for a while. Uh, so pretty much that first year was a wash. And then they opened back up. And then we started, you know, renovating kind of sporadically. It was never a rush. And then what did you spend in renovations? I don't know if you remember this. Like you said this on the video. Yeah, I did. Uh, in one of the videos, I kind of went over the cost. Okay. But um, so I spent in total about 35K. Okay. Not because I had to, right? What happened is I wanted to redo the bathroom completely. I see the bathroom. That was nice. I redid the kitchen completely. Um, Ikea. It was like Ikea first? Yeah, it was an Ikea. It looked beautiful, though. Yeah, it was an Ikea kitchen. So there's Ikea out there? In Catania, yeah. How far is that? Uh, two and a half hours. Oh, that's not bad. Yeah. It's Somebody's reasonable. little truck. Yeah. Uh, well, they deliver. Yeah. So, so, so this is not that. So, you know, I'm thinking in my head, I've been to a lot of places. I'm like, okay, this has got to be a fairly remote a area where, you know, it's actually kind of convenient to a lot of places. Yeah. It's actually central Island where in on the Island of Sicily is like right in the middle. So I could get, I could get to the beach in 45 minutes. I could get to the main international airport in about two hours. Like, the, the capital city is Palermo. Mm -hmm. It's a historic city. It's nice. So you can get there, enjoy the nightlife. That's two hours away. Um, 
you're pretty much within an hour or two of all the coasts and all the major cities yeah. down there. So I got to ask, you're the only black guy in town? 10,000 people? No, actually, I'm not. Um, there's a few African immigrants there, and there's a few African Americans who bought there. Okay. Um, some of them who've seen the so content. Seen your video. It's right? crazy. So I'll, I'll, you'll come across people on the street. It's, but, yeah. There's, I interviewed the mayor, and uh, it was about 18 different nationalities have purchased there. Okay. And Sicily is interesting because a lot of, you know, you're, you're, you're touching on the, the race bit, but a lot of people don't realize that Sicily was occupied by the Spanish, by the Turks, by mm -hmm. the Greeks, by Northern Africans. So they're accustomed to assimilating. So they're not really looking at people based on color or anything like that. They're yeah. looking at who you are as a person. Are you a good person? Are you respectable? Are you friendly? And they're extremely friendly. Like Italian hospitality is like no other. They'll Better than Southern you. hospitality? Yeah, for sure. They'll invite you into your house, into their house their first day. So let, let's touch on a subject while we're while I brought up the race thing. I want to I just want to I've traveled in quite a bit of places. You travel and live quite a bit of places. What are the race relations when you travel abroad, right? Because you have, um, obviously, you're a black guy from Queens. Um, mm -hmm. You're married. Your wife, where's your wife from? Venezuela. Your wife was Venezuelan, right? So you guys are traveling to Italy. Like They're like, what is going on? You got some beautiful kids. I've seen your kids online. Mm -hmm. And then so like, what is the, what is, what is the, re what is it when you go to these places? Well, right now I own and have control of properties in the U.S., Brazil, Colombia, Italy, and I'm about to buy something in Spain. We travel between all. Mm -hmm. And I got to say that every place that I've been to, and I've traveled to, I don't know, 30, 40 countries so far, I've never encountered the type of racism that I have encountered and have grown accustomed to in the United States. So the United States is unique to that position of, it's, it has its own type of special. It has its own special kind of racism that's totally baked in to the culture in ways that it's somewhat masked, but obvious if you're, <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a strange thing. Um, and you could like Trevor Noah, who's from South Africa mm -hmm. or uh, Dave Matthews, who's a, I'm not sure if you know the Dave Matthews band, he's a white yeah. musician, but he's from South Africa. I didn't he, know that. I didn't, I didn't know he was from South Africa. Yeah. When he, he was like, when he came to the United States, he was like, I'm from South Africa. And the racism here is crazy. Like to, he comes from apartheid in South Africa. And he's like, this is different. This is different. Right. So what I've noticed is like, I, I've, I've already conditioned myself to, I, I don't box myself in because of my race. I think that's absurd. Yeah. And I don't let people do that to me. Yeah. So whenever I was traveling to new countries, of course, you're a little on edge. How are they going to treat me as a... You don't know how it's going to go. You know how it's going to go. But I really started to realize very early on that most places in the world, if not every place that I've been to, my race is just my color. And everybody's more interested in what my story is. To kind of where are you from? Where you, where, where are you from? Where are you from? Where am I from? What do I do? What is it like in America? They're more curious about just America in general than anything having to do with race. So yeah. it, it you, you actually forget that you're carrying this race thing, yeah. which is almost impossible for black men to do or black people in the United States. Yeah, like nice race is like race is part of identity in America, unfortunately, and everywhere else, race is just an expression of your color, just like hair color. Like it's it's an absurd concept. So it's safe to say when you travel, you need to kind of get rid of that baked in thing we've been living with all our life because it's not the same and you should just travel more anyways. Get rid of it here. Yeah. Right. Get rid of it here and definitely don't take that crap with you overseas. Yeah. yeah. Right. Because it's, gonna, it's just going to affect your overall experience. Like uh, one of my buddies came down to Columbia and we pulled up to one of the nicer restaurants in the tourist section in the prime neighborhood is Poblado uh, Medellin. And they're like, do you have reservations? And I was like, no, nah, we, we don't have reservations. And she's like, hold on a second. So she looks around. She's, there was one crappy table in the corner. Mm -hmm. and she was like, do you mind if we take you back there? It's like not really a good table, but whatever. We sit down. And the first thing out of my boy's mouth is they sat us here because we're black. No, she sat you there because you got a table. 
right? But that was his thinking. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. I was like, look around. Look at the staff. People are equally represented here, whether they're like indigenous looking, white, Spaniard looking, black, and everything in between because they mix way more than we do here. It's not because you're black. Leave that crap back in the United States. Don't bring that stuff down here because that's not how people are thinking down here. So when when people, that's a common question I get asked. It's like, what about the racism? And what about how they're treating you as a black person? Like, I heard they're really racist. I was like, you know why you, you think Italians are racist? I was like, because you encountered Italian Americans. <laughs> not the true. Not the yeah, true. They, they ain't and, about that life. But you got to think about this. That's, I'm, why, why are Italian Americans racist? I don't know. I don't know many of them, so I don't know. So I'm from New York, so yeah. there's a lot of Italian Americans. When they came to New York, they were the strange immigrants, and they were treated negatively. Mm -hmm. So they created their own communities, and they knew that they had to pick a box. So I'm Italian. The Irish, same thing. Right? So the, America forces you to hold on to your culture. You go to Brazil, where people, there were tons of people who came there during World War II. Or Argentina, same thing. A lot of Italians, a lot of Germans down there. They still wave the Argentinian flag. They wave the Brazilian flag. They become Brazilian. Only in America do immigrants still wave their nation's flag because they have to find their identity within America because they're never accepted. It's forced. To, yeah, you have to keep So that the Italians aren't like that. It's only the ones that have assimilated to the American way that are like that. And it's sad. Wow. That's interesting and deep to think of. It's, and it's, I've definitely felt as I travel more and more and more countries, I feel a lot, that burden is kind of lifted off my shoulder. I feel like I will, I'm going to age a little bit less each year. Yeah, for sure. And look, everywhere I go, people are just curious as to who I am and what I'm about. And it's really refreshing. And, you know, Race is taught here from maybe five years old, right? We start celebrating Black History Month. Mm -hmm. You start learning about segregation and what Martin Luther King stood for. And mm -hmm. so that is taught very early on. It's part of our history is what it is. But the last thing that I want for my two little girls are to grow up thinking that they're somehow other or different or less than and start putting these ceilings on themselves. Because it happens in, in the Black community. It's naturally right. It happens in the black community. It's awful because you have guys that were, you know, you grew up with super talented. They put the ceiling on themselves. Then they assimilate to this version of what, you know, a black American is. And they fit in the box. They fit in the box and they end up in the box, right? Whether it's jail or dead or whatever. So I, it's not, this is not where I would want to raise my kids because they have a high probability of ending up that way, even though they're innocent kids. Yeah. You said you you interviewed the mayor of that town. Mm -hmm. What where do you think it's going? Like, are like because it it just seems so like first of all, try to get a house that you could live in for thirty five thousand dollars if you wanted to. It might not be. I mean, it's a town of ten thousand people, but it's still connected to the rest of a lot of places. Like I was asking, I was like, yeah, I could probably if I get in my plane, I could probably do two hours from Egypt to to where to where I want to be in. So, all right, cool. So now look at that. Where, where are they going with this? Where do you think it's going? A, a lot of people ask me that, especially real estate mm -hmm. folks. Is this a good investment or not? I don't care if it's a good investment. Yeah. It's fun. It's That's how it is for me. The problem is Italy has a, next to Japan, has the fastest declining population. Their issue is replenishment. And these smaller towns are shrinking because people are dying, of course, but the youth are going to the big cities, especially after they opened up the EU zone, right? And people could go wherever and, and work. In the European Union and all that stuff? Yeah. So if before you were just confined to Italy and you couldn't work in Germany, you couldn't work in England, mm -hmm. right? Because you didn't have the visa to work. But once they opened it up, people are. they started leaving for college opportunities, for employment opportunities. So... Unless people come in and start creating jobs, kind of like you look at downtown Winston, what that was 20 years ago, how much has changed. Yeah, you have to attract entrepreneurs. You have to attract people who have a vision for that place. And I think that's what's happening now because a lot of people are coming in and saying, hey, this, this needs a coffee shop and this needs this sort of service. 
and they're bringing that. So is there potential for more people to buy in? I think so. And they would be adding things that the community needs. My concern is that you're still playing, you know, against time and people need to reproduce. Like in our generation, you're even seeing people having less children than people 30 years ago. Yeah. So offsetting children is becoming commonplace, especially in the developed worlds, right? More education, more birth control, less kids. So that needs to get reversed. So jobs need to be brought in and people need to be encouraged to, you know. So, but what about like people part-time living? You're part-time. You're not going to be there full-time. Well, what we do is we create employment opportunities. Okay. Right? From that district. From, j- just from creating, just doing the renovation. Yeah, right? yeah that makes We've sense. We've created, created jobs. I put my properties on Airbnb. They don't really rent that much. It's not like a tourist town. Not yet, but, but we'll change that. They could change. And <laughs> the cleaners, you know, they get compensated for their work. They check on the properties. So I think ultimately there is some potential there. Like there's one project that I'm looking at. It's an abandoned orphanage. Huge. And I think it would be an awesome kind of work live sort of loft space. And I've been kind of promoting it. How much do you think you need? I think that's going to need about 1.5. Okay. Right. Um, so what I would like to do is see if there's a way to partition it out so that units are going for thirty or 50000 attract the artisans, attract the creators, and bring them to this orphanage so that they could participate in the renovation of this building and kind of bring some life in. Um, so I've been talking about that a little bit on my channel to see – you know, who, who would be yeah. yeah who'd be interested and if it's something that we could do i think, we could do I think it. what's cool about as my mind starts to think it's like it's like being able to create sims or like this new and obviously people live there so i don't want to go like and completely rechange their city but mm-hmm. in a city that has in a, in a town that has ten thousand people who could add you know like like you said the coffee shop and then this and then things that attract people like how can you get it to where you do have a good amount of short-term rentals that attract people. What can you create in that community that will attract people to that particular region? So they got, they got a really well restored castle there Mm -hmm. or like preserved castle. So events at the castle or the castle overlooks like some farmland. Mm -hmm. So festivals, music festivals with the castle in the backdrop would be pretty dope. Um, hot air ballooning, I think, would be pretty interesting because it's these wide open landscapes. Have you ever been to Cappadocia, I'm Turkey? Not. Beautiful, best place to probably go hot air ballooning. But something like that in central Sicily could do really well. I think people, for me, it's about trying to bring people with vision there. Yeah, exactly. The, the, the maniacs that go there are people like me and you, people who see the potential in. The nothing and say, well, I can make something nice here and I could promote it. And because the people who are there are just used to this being home and they're kind of resigned. And that's yeah. what even what the mayor told me. He's like, the people that are coming in, that's the real value add. He's like, that's the best thing that's happened to this town because we have people educated in different places who see different things and they're importing all of that knowledge to our community and adding to it. And they're welcome to that. It's like they're okay with their town changing as long as their town stays alive. So I, I know what I'm doing. You're going to probably be there sometime in the summer with your family. I am going to be in Dubai and Egypt. Um, I want to come there. I want you to sh- give me some like a couple options maybe before I get there. Mm-hmm. But then me and my wife want to buy something out there, you know, something that we could renovate, but not a one dollar joint. I don't want that. <laughs> yeah. I want uh, something. I wouldn't advise it. Yeah. I want something <laughs> that we can put our own little touch onto it. Mm-hmm. Um Maybe a little bit, maybe like the second one you got, like the one that's a little bit bigger, not the one bedroom. And then what that way we can turn it into what we want because our goal is is to have multiple homes on multiple continents, and multiple parts of continents. And and I want to do that. And I, I noticed on your one of your videos, like since you've done it twice and you got the team to do the renovations, you're like, hey, look, if you want to buy a house in Italy in this area, hit me up. Right, yeah. So what what I decided to do because it is Italy, so their their processes are very different than. America. Yeah, I was going to ask you that, but yeah. keep keep going. Like their processes are different, so they move at a different pace. Um, for example, Italy pretty much closes in August, and it becomes just tourism. So don't expect to get anything done in August. Really, right? Yeah. It's a, a What's so Fata. special about August? 
It's the end of the summer. Enjoy your life. Okay. That's I like that. <laughs> I like that. Shut it That's down. It. Yeah, well, Except whatever. for my staff. Don't yeah, shut it's down. Except for my staff. Yeah, it's a get. Don't shut it down. Enjoy the beach and enjoy life. What are you dealing with work? That's yeah. their mentality. So as an American business owner, you have to get used to that. But I saw a lot of gaps in their processes because they just function differently. Like there's not an MLS in Italy, right? You would think. In, t- in the entire country nothing nothing like that so there's no all the brokers have their listings and it's their listings i saw that in ghana too yeah it's like that in so many countries and it's uh, that's something that i that's there's a some potential there to create or recreate mls's in other countries but i put together a team um at cheap houses in italy so i have cheap Cecilia, houses in italy.com cheap, cheap houses in italy.com um i have a project manager slash interior yeah. designer uh, her name is Cecilia. She actually bought property there as well and has fallen in love with the city and has been helping people to kind of get acclimated. She's like a connector of all kinds. Mm-hmm. And I work with a contractor. His name is Luca. And together we're kind of scouting, reviewing, pricing out renovations for folks and managing it if they want us to do so. So we're the link to those who are selling homes, link with the agencies. And if you need assistance renovating, because a lot of people don't do what we do. Yeah. Right? They look at a flip. I still would at, have assistance. Like I, yeah. I just would want it. I would pick out some things, but I still would want somebody else to do it. Yeah, of course. But some people have not even tried. Okay, I get it. Yeah. Right? They're, they're total virgin. So it's, it's a big step for them. So we're there to help out in that capacity. You know, you know what would be real cool? I was just thinking as you were speaking, I was like, what if like 30 people like you and I just bought homes there and kind of like made it our summer joint or whenever? We'd be like, hey, yo, Next month, we're going to be there. Let's all meet up. And we're all like successful entrepreneurs, millionaires, and we just meet in this little small town of Italy and we and do it up. convene, have some, like, it's like a, fr- it's like a mastermind, but the only entry is buy a property. Yeah, that w- I think that would be interesting. There, so Musa Meli I love because that's where I got properties, but I'm looking to do another project by the coast uh, in a coastal town near Palermo. I think... I think you'd like it there better than Musamele. And how far is Musamele from there? Uh, about two hours. Okay. So it's right next to Palermo Airport. It's going to cost a lot more, isn't it? Sub 200 grand. It's more than I was wanting to spend. But <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think you can swing it. It's under 200. Yeah, you know, yeah. I, I think you can swing it. It's I was under, thinking like under 100, you know. You might be able to find some, depending on size, yeah, depending on where. So Because it's a beach town. It's a beach town. Um, it. The population goes from 15,000 in the off season to about 60,000, but beautiful coastal views, mountains. It's, it's so I scenic. I kind of like so the 10,000 nice. town though. Yeah, uh, yeah. I like it too, but I really like the coast. Maybe because you're from Winston, man. So you're, you're ready for how well, four hours know, from the coast. Yeah. Well, plane 45 minutes. Yeah. Plane 45 minutes. Which we're both pilots, by the yeah, way. Yeah. Yeah. We yeah. both fly, but I like, I like being near the water. And so, I, I think I really, and I really like this town. It's like, I love it there. Our plan is Dubai, home, mm-hmm. Egypt, condo, Italy, home, Ghana, home, could be on the coast. And then the Jamaica estate and Trelawney on the beach. So I don't want too many beach fronts, man. You want it? Well, because the, because the, because the I Dubai home is waterfront. It's not yeah. beachfront, but it's, 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 you know, yeah. I don't know. We'll see. 200 scared me. I don't, I don't think you should be scared by 200. No, it's not the 200. It's, it's that I'm going to be there one time. You know, yeah. it'd be, I, I, so, it'd so be what, cool what, to what, have a place where it's like all like-minded folks. Yeah. We just got a group chat and we're like, we're all going to pull up. Uh, 13 of us are going to pull up. Let's just go there and we're going to, it's almost like you can sway the economy. I think with the synergy of 30 of us owning homes there, it's your, sure. it's your entry into the, to the mastermind. Yeah, I think I think I think it could be kind of positioned that way, especially if it's a diverse group of entrepreneurs. Yeah, exactly. It has to be because from all different walks. They can they could say, all right, you know what? Each year we take on this project, right? This is going to be the year of uh, I don't know the bakery or the, the year of the orphanage redo or the year of the uh, media room or whatever the case may be. I think I think that could work well, and I think it's kind of hard to. Go to Sicily and not fall in love with it. I guarantee you, if you come down and I show you Musomeli, I show you by the coast. And the, I know I'm going to love it. You're going to be like, man, I think I might have to have a house on the coast and in the countryside. 
That can guarantee. happen. Because the countryside is cool because you, you really get to separate from mainstream. So if you want to disconnect, Musumeli is fantastic. And like I said, the people are, are great. But you want to kind of party on the coast a little bit, enjoy the boat life, et cetera, then you got to go to the coast. It's a, it's a, for me, that's why I'm getting more properties down there because it's going to satisfy kind of both. Yeah. You spend longer time down there. Mm-hmm. It'd be cool though to think back that like those 30 guys changed, changed, changed the, the fabric of this town and maybe other and, towns. And too. spread to towns next door and mm-hmm. things like that. Man, I'm a little excited. Yeah. I'd, I'd wire you 30. Oh, no, the qu- question. Talking about wiring 30, I'd, I'd wire you 35, 40,000 right now. The thing is, is with buying the buying process, mm-hmm. how long did it take in a regular time? Like, not long. Um, I would say budget maybe 60 days for it. Okay. Because the, the buying process is a lot like uh, states that don't require attorneys to close. Okay. So, like, there, the title is called like notary. Like the title agency would mm-hmm. be the notary public. Mm-hmm. And they're the ones who are responsible for doing the kind of title search, deed, kind of settling out of any outstanding debts, you know, typical title work. Um, so they're going to do their bit. Everything at the, I'll take it back. The first step is you have to get what's called a codice fiscale. It's a tax ID number. Okay. With the codice fiscale, you could put a house in contract and do a transaction. You need identification and you need a, Codice Fiscali. So you bind the property like you would any other property. And then you hire the notary. The notary does the title search. Uh, if you're not physically in Italy, you're going to have to assign a power of attorney. So there's a formal document for that. So that gets notarized here, apostille, and then sent back. So that might take, I don't know, three weeks between the mailing and getting your official stamp. That might add some time, but the notary work, the actual work in Italy should be one month to 60 days between all of that. So it's a, it's almost the same process. And it's, then when they give you clear to close is when you wire the rest of the money or something? Yeah. You wire the money directly to the seller. After they tell you clear to close? Yeah. They, oh, yeah. We're clear to close. Just make sure you send me proof that you made the wire. Oh, then that's and cool. Then, and they, they have to confirm. Like, it's, it's a little more honest. So it's yeah. not like it gets escrowed and they settle out. This is the this is the closing amount. This is my fees. Send it. Send him his closing amount. Send me send mine. mine. And yeah, You're good to go. Wire was easy though. Yeah, yeah the, the banking system is, so is okay. Is easy. Yeah. I man, yeah, me excited over here because I'm. I, I was I'm glad. I'm, yeah, I'm serious. Because it, it's a, it's it's been one of the most fulfilling things that I've done. Because me, me me and your me and my wife watch your channel and mm-hmm. we're looking at it like oh, I can't wait for it to come over. I can't wait. Yeah, and the thing is, cost of living. In, in Italy is really low, surprisingly low. People think because they're on the Euro standard that things are expensive. Give me a pasta dish. Where's it going? <laughs> nice pasta dinner. Uh, seven to nine euros. Wow. And they're, that's about a dollar for dollar, right? You're on a right dollar? Right now, yeah. It's almost, it's almost a dollar Peg for dollar. Now, it's, this is why now is the time to buy there. Like the US dollar has been the strongest I've seen in my lifetime. Probably same with you. Yeah, so that's why I'm starting to buy more property internationally that's why i bought the diversify where your money is sitting exactly diversify your, your money diversify your passports diversify your residencies there don't, living, don't call yourself a passport bro if you got one passport no nah, i've only got one passport <laughs> <laughs> you got diversified I've got one. yeah no i do um, it's coming for you though. yeah i next year i think i'll get my venezuelan which doesn't really help me much unfortunately. Still, it, 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 not in the sense of visa free travel but mm-hmm. it helps it helps, yeah. Just to, just to have it, I would be able to apply for my Colombian citizenship in ten years. Right now, I have what's called a migrant class um, visa. Mm-hmm. It gives me three years of residency in Colombia. I set up uh, one of my offices out there, and I have a team out there that I work with. Okay. Going back to like the the health aid, healthcare agency, why don't I hear more people talking about that? Seems like a because it seems like something you can do without. Having a ton of money to start? Yeah, you don't need much money to start as a nursing agency. And why you don't hear many people talking about it is because there's not many people talking about it. I'm There's like me and one other woman that are kind of popular in the space. People just don't talk about what they know. Because that's, what affor- that's what's afford you to live this lifestyle. Uh, predominantly, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, it's part so, of it. Big yeah, part of it. Big chunk of my income comes from healthcare. 
then from real estate. That's kind of like the one, two for me. Mm-hmm. Um, but what, what I've done is I've worked directly with healthcare professionals. Most of our clients are nurses, physical therapists, physicians. I'm onboarding a, a dentist now. These are healthcare workers who have worked on the, for an agency, are tired because healthcare will drain you, mm-hmm. and are like, hey, I don't know if I should switch careers or if there's a business <laughs> opportunity for me here. Yeah. And fortunately, I've been able to fill that gap and be that teacher of how to start these businesses. It's not, it's not that hard. So for less than twenty thousand dollars, you can build a business that could that you could generate a million dollars in revenue in probably two to three years if you're just steady and progressive. Yeah, because it's these are high ticket clients. Like it's not uncommon to have a a nursing contract that's paying you one hundred and twenty dollars an hour for an RN that you're paying fifty dollars an hour. How much is your thing to sign up? I got an idea. Okay, so it, it depends. Well, I'm, I'm, <laughs> okay, give me some yeah. levels. So we have we have. I'll walk you through the levels of what we offer. Mm-hmm. So we have a group mentoring option, right? That's a once a month meeting of the minds, right? Come in, different stage. You just need help, guidance on how to contract, how to sell, how to recruit, etc. Then we have an online course, eight hours, eight lessons, where if you watch the video and you do your assignments you will open your agency by like lesson number five, right? So that walks you through setting up an entity, getting your tax ID number, market research, et cetera. That's $900 once. If it lasts one year subscription for 900 bucks. Then we have a premium offering, which combines kind of the two, the mentoring portion, the group mentoring, and the online course. Plus we give some documentation like uh, policy procedure, template, application documents, just the fundamentals of what you would need. That's two business in a box type thing. Um, sort of, mm-hmm. sort of business in a box, but still my belief is to allow people to take the steps themselves. Correct. Yeah. You so got they, it, so. they could learn the mechanics of the business. Then we have a higher ticket offering, which we kind of handpick who we work with because we don't want to extract dollars from people. Mm-hmm. So we do everything for you. We get you from logo design, web development, we get you on our software. I, we've developed our proprietary software for home health care, health care staffing, and social adult daycares. So that's a, another another hustle. But we get you onto that software. We do your policy and procedures, state-specific, get you all the insurances, and we even get you funding for payroll because that's usually the biggest hurdle for people. You're covering nurses' salaries. For how long before you get that money? Like maybe 60 days, a lot of those contracts. So- they're usually limited by Money. how much they could put out. So we have a relationship with a lender that we kind of get you into that. And, uh, you know, it's a case by case. You know, different states require different things. So we price it according to the effort that it commands. But we're talking about fifteen to $30,000 to get someone started. I like that. And that's the a la carte one. Yeah, we do everything. And then the... Two thousand dollars one for the one with the documentation that you need to Yeah, so it's like it's like mid level. So for someone who's like a self starter who could follow directions and it's like, hey, you know what, I just want to do this. I would say that if you're the self starter type, starting one of these agencies is gonna cost you between five and six thousand. That's in- inclusive of our fees because you still have to cover insurance, you still have to get certain things, set up your website, however, however you're doing that, whether mm-hmm. you're using a service or you're paying somebody. But you're gonna have about a five to six thousand dollar out of pocket cost just to get started. So it's a really inexpensive business, and for healthcare professionals, most of them do well enough that that's not a burden for them. Mm-hmm. But it's really freeing, and I really like working with nurses because the worst thing that could happen to a nurse is that they get a contract and they staff themselves. So instead of getting paid fifty dollars an hour, they've just boosted their salary to the hundred and twenty range. <laughs> so if you're the only employee. You doubled your you salary. doubled you doubled your salary just by knowing how to structure yourself as a business, and then you know on on the flip side of things, with the right guidance, you grow these agencies into the millions. They start becoming interesting to people who are buying, like me, mm-hmm. or to the other private equity firms that are gobbling these companies up. In purchasing home care agencies and in purchasing staffing companies, the biggest issue that I find when I'm reviewing deals is that these are start, started by nurses, family businesses, they never get their financials right. Mm -hmm. And that's going to get you beat down on price or get you passed altogether. 
right? Because most, for those who aren't familiar, in the private equity world, you're doing a leverage buyout of, of a company using their cash flow to qualify for this loan. Correct. If you're selling a business for a few million dollars, the financials need to make sense to the bank. And if they don't make sense to the bank, there's no deal, right? So there, there's no, I haven't found, there's some distressed lenders out there, but they, they're not really, they're not as friendly it's as gonna real estate. It's going to cost you a lot. It's going it's to cost you a lot, but they're not, they're still kind of shy on what to pull the trigger on. Mm -hmm. So I like to work with our clients to get them to a sellable point. There's, this is probably the best way, in my opinion, for the average working class healthcare worker to go from the bedside to millionaire status. And it, I wouldn't say it's easy, but it's definitely doable, and we have a pathway for that. That's crazy, man. I, I'm serious. I haven't heard too many people on that. That's that's insane, man. Um, I'm I'm a, I'm gonna talk to you because I got some people that I think I may want to put like in my family that I think my mom's retired mm -hmm. just from that same profession. She's a nurse. Yeah, she's retired from that same thing. Yeah. So, so it's just like just like she just retired in December, and but my sister is is my older sister was in the healthcare industry as on the front end, mm -hmm. administrative side, which is great because so so in and my, my other sister is a respiratory technician, respiratory therapist. Cool. So in high demand right now. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so the thing is, what's I really like where you're going with this because. Most people, when they think healthcare staffing, default to nursing. Mm -hmm. But you could do it with respiratory therapists, physical therapists, speech pathologists, social workers, physicians, dentists, uh, radiation disimetrists, radiation therapists. Like, I don't know half of them were, yeah, but I don't know what you're but saying. But it's the entire industry, <laughs> right? So everybody defaults to nurses. And like, oh, I don't understand nursing, right? So I can't do it. If, you're, if you are a healthcare worker, you're job can certainly be staffed through an agency mm -hmm. so my mom talked about it all the time yeah no, it's no new don came in new i'm like yeah i don't I know exactly what you mean but yeah cool and, and this this is dope man this has been a good conversation because i've learned so much and i think i think a lot of this can benefit to the audience in the sense of look traveling buying property vacation homes um another outlet outside of real estate, like to get your start in? Because the ultimate goal is to get real estate, but how do you get to the point where you can get real estate? Yeah, my, my formula, what I teach people, get a job that's secure, right? Go to college, get a job that's secure, that makes you 60, 70,000 dollars a year, you can live okay. Start a business. Let that business grow to a point where it's spinning off enough cash for you that you could take forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars a year and buy a house. Start learning real estate. Start investing that cash into assets, mm -hmm. and start building out your book that way. And if you are savvy and motivated, then start learning the private equity game. Learn how to consolidate businesses. Learn how to grow businesses. Because once you start learning that, you'll see that that applies to real estate. It applies to your nursing practice. That applies to everything that you could see, right? I'm sure you could look around and see consolidation opportunities everywhere. Yeah. Right? Because people usually kind of cap out at the small business phase. They're comfortable just calling their own shots. But if I could say what's allowed me to generate wealth over the years is exactly that. Work a job. Don't depend on your business income for a while. Whatever you're spinning off, reinvest that into assets that you understand. And real estate is very easy to understand. Mm -hmm. Right. Everybody's involved in real estate. Yeah. Whether you're renting or owning, you're involved with it. Yeah. You, whether you're renting, owning, you, like it's very easy to understand, easy to get financing for relative to other any other business. That is a formula that's worked for me and what I would recommend for anybody else. And, you know, I really think people don't, people see you and me on social media and say, oh, is this person even worth learning from? Mm -hmm. Every single time that I've spent money on a conference mm -hmm. or anything. One-on-ones, anything, yeah. I've learned that first house that I got, right? So $2,000 for the grant conference. I got $8,000 in a tax credit. I still own that property. It's up like 250 k or something like that in equity. And after my first year of living in the basement there and renting out 
mm-hmm. the rest Absolutely, of the house. Yeah. Now we are collecting five thousand dollars a month in rent on that house. Mortgage is thirty three hundred dollars. So cash flow. It's been fourteen years of that. So how much money have I made on that one conference where I learned about that one program? Take advantage of people who know. Take advantage of your thought leaders, the people who are actually doing it. Build your business and build a life that you're looking for. Money you made and net worth increase. Yeah. Off of one. Off of one conference. I got like 20. So just progressive, Mm -hmm. right? It it, it starts with one. It doesn't start with 20. That's the mistake people make. It's like, oh, you know, you could do this because of all these things that you had. It's like, no, it starts with one nurse placed, Mm -hmm. one property purchased, one new opportunity. It's dope, man. It's been an enlightening conversation. Um, I got one last question for you. Um, if you had the entire tension of the entire world, if you had tension of the entire world, and you had one minute to speak to them, what would you say? Huh. And I want you to say it to that camera. The first thing I would say is follow me on all platforms. That's ENTP Life on YouTube, and then Instagram, TikTok, etc. Shoot me a DM, send me your name, phone number, and email address. That's what's <laughs> most important to me. I need contacts. I need information. But if I was going to say something that was beneficial to the public, which is actually what matters, is that you have to live life executing on the things that are in your imagination. The worst thing that I think can happen to anybody is to be on their deathbed at some point in time and say, I wish I did. I guarantee you, if you start acting on the things that you wish you did, you would achieve those things in this lifetime and live the life of your dreams. So don't put a cap on anything that you're doing. If you could envision it, if you could think it, you could do it. And if you do it, you'll be so satis- you'll be so satisfied with what you've done. I love it, man. Carl, this has been enlightening. Uh, obviously we're going to leave all the links down and below where the people reach out to you. I'm actually going to reach out to them. I'm going to purchase something from you because I think it's just interesting to let my family explore an option of being able to create something. Um, not that my mom wants to go back and work or nothing, but I think it's, <laughs> my, my, you know. but she's got contacts. Yeah, she's got contacts. Exactly. So, um, listen, man, this is, this is the Max Maxwell show. I'm Max Maxwell. If you've been listening this far, you know what to do. Hit that subscribe button. If you're in pod land, Hit the five star. Give us a rating. Go follow my man, Carl. Go listen to him. Some interesting stuff. Somebody that I'm learning from. So if I'm learning from him, you definitely can learn as well. So I'll see you guys in the next one. I'm Max Maxwell. And we're out. Peace.